Welcome to Cinematic Excrement and my ongoing quest to review every movie that has won the Razzie for Worst Picture. We are now up to the year 1998. So close to being done with the 90s. Too bad Disney isn't. I mean, look at the movies they've been putting out lately. Just remake after remake of their classic 90s animated films. But this time, they're live action, whether they should be or not. And they should not. Beauty and the Beast was a musical directed by someone who doesn't know how to direct musicals. Aladdin? Ditto. The Lion King showed photorealism isn't always a good thing. And Mulan? Well, I haven't seen Mulan because I'm not paying 30 bucks for it, but I've heard bad things. And they're still not done. There's a live-action remake of Hercules in the works. Will the madness never cease? Now you might be asking yourself, why am I complaining about Disney? Well, two reasons. One, because they took the time to bitch and moan about not being able to reopen Disneyland during a goddamn pandemic and somehow blamed the California state government for this instead of, you know, the pandemic, while at the same time patting themselves on the back for paying their furloughed workers health insurance during said pandemic. Oh, did the big multi-billion dollar corporation find it in the goodness of their hearts to pay for their furloughed workers' health insurance while a deadly virus ravages the country? Yay! Good for you! What do you want, a cookie? You don't get extra credit for doing the bare minimum for your workers while, at the same time, restoring executive salaries to pre-COVID levels, you cheap capitalist penny-pinching Scrooge McDuck motherfucker. <laughs>And the second reason is they are responsible for the travesty I am about to review today. An Alan Smithy film, Burn Hollywood Burn. This is a mockumentary, kind of, more on that later, about a small-time director played by Eric Idle who finally gets his big break when he is hired to direct Trio, a big-budget action movie starring Sylvester Stallone, Whoopi Goldberg, and Jackie Chan. That's an interesting combination. The cynic in me wonders if they were the only three big names who said yes. The realist in me is thinking the same thing. However, after a troubled production and the producers butchering his vision in the editing room, the director wants to disown the film. Fortunately, the Directors Guild of America has an easy way to do this. Just remove your name from the credits and replace it with the pseudonym Alan Smithy. Unfortunately, this director's name is actually Alan Smithy, making it literally impossible for him to disown the film. So as a last resort to save his good name, he steals the original camera negative before the studio can make any prints and threatens to burn it. Now, on paper, this sounds like the setup for a decent comedy at least. I mean, a director named Alan Smithy. The joke writes itself. Plus, Idol is a good comedic actor. You got Sly, Whoopi, Jackie, and a few other celebrities willing to poke fun at themselves on camera. This should have at least been okay, if not spectacular. So what went wrong? Well, when you look at who was behind the camera, it looks like this movie was doomed from the start. First of all, this movie was a joint production between Hollywood Pictures and Synergy Pictures. Hollywood Pictures is a now defunct arm of the Walt Disney Company, which I ranted about a few minutes ago. Why is this a problem? Well, an Alan Smithy film is supposed to be a satire of the movie industry and studio executives. Can we really trust Disney to handle that? I know Disney is not necessarily above making fun of themselves, the princess scene in Ralph Breaks the Internet comes to mind, but when they do, it tends to be pretty tame. I don't personally trust them to not pull their punches here. It also makes the tagline on the poster feel pretty disingenuous. This was produced and distributed by one of the biggest companies in Hollywood, and it was advertised as the movie Hollywood doesn't want you to see. Well, not many people saw it, so mission accomplished. As for Synergy Pictures, that also now defunct studio was led by Andrew G. Vina, the film's executive producer. If you've been following my series of Razzie Award winners, that name should sound familiar. He's the producer who got into a very public spat with director Richard Rush over the final cut of Color of Night. And we all saw how that turned out. And now, three years later, Mr. Vina is producing a movie in which a director has a very public spat with a producer over the final cut of a film. That's... Probably a coincidence. Probably. Nevertheless, if there is anyone whose opinion on a producer meddling with a director's vision that I do not want to hear, it's Andrew freaking Vina. No thank you, sir. 
If that wasn't bad enough, the screenplay was written by Joe Esterhaus, who also appears in the film as himself. That name should also sound familiar if you've been watching my videos of late. He wrote the screenplay for Showgirls. Yeah, that's who we're dealing with. That is all of the bad signs. As for the director, Arthur Hiller, he appears to have a somewhat respectable filmography, including a Best Director nomination, so I guess his presence is one relatively bright spot. But are you ready for the ultimate dose of irony? Hiller was apparently unsatisfied with the theatrical cut of this film, reportedly done by Esther Huss as an uncredited producer, and asked for his name to be taken off. So in the end, an Alan Smithy film was in fact an Alan Smithy film. Now there is some debate as to whether this squabble between the director and the studio was legitimate or not. Hiller, for the record, claims it was. Esterhaus, however, claims Hiller was with him in the editing room and still had input into the final cut. And critic Nathan Rabin noted Hiller removing his name from the film was, quote, very transparently not a stupid, stupid gimmick to raise interest in a terrible film. So was Hiller's decision based upon a legitimate beef with Esterhaus, or was it all a work? Well, you are of course free to investigate yourselves and come up with your own opinions. Personally, I have thought long and hard about it, I have weighed the evidence on both sides, and ultimately the conclusion that I have personally come to is that I do not care. So let's move on. The movie opens with a trailer for the film within the film, Trio, which we are then told is a movie no one ever saw because the director stole and destroyed the negative. And we're about to hear that story, which is divided into three acts, each with its own title card. And as soon as the first one shows up, you'll notice something is... off. What? Yes, that's the Woody Woodpecker theme. This song plays at the beginning of each act for reasons science has not been able to explain. Is this some inside joke that I'm just not getting? Or was it just a random choice? I can't say for sure, but I'm willing to bet on the latter. Because this movie's entire soundtrack is a hot mess. Because of the low budget, they could not afford any well-known artists, except for Public Enemy, for reasons we'll get to later, so Joe Esterhaus put out a call for unsigned bands to submit their work for the film. Reportedly, he got over 9,000 submissions. Now, law of probability dictates there must have been some good music in there somewhere, and yet, Every song on this soundtrack that was not done by Public Enemy is crap, and often has nothing to do with the scene in which it's featured. I'm giving condoms for Christmas. You're giving what to who now? I see two possible reasons for this. Either Esterhaus has terrible taste in music, or he just got tired of sifting through 9,000 freaking submissions and finally just said screw it and threw a few in at random. I'm actually inclined to believe the former because one of the songs was co-written by Esterhaus himself. And it is amazingly terrible. The song is called I Wanna Be Mike Ovitz, and it features some jagoff screaming over and over again, I wanna be Mike Ovitz! That's it. That's the song. If you don't believe me, look it up. It's on YouTube. Now some of you may be wondering, who the hell is Mike Ovitz? Well, the answer is, Google it. I'm pretty sure most of my audience is Millennials and Gen Z. You all know how the internet works. Do the research yourselves, you lazy bastards! Oh, alright, fine, I'll tell you. I need to pad out the running time for this video anyway. Stupid algorithm. Michael Ovitz is the former head and co-founder of the Creative Artists Agency, which had several big-name actors, directors, and screenwriters under its wing. He was at one time one of the most powerful and feared men in Hollywood. Reportedly, he ran his business like a friggin' mafia don. Esterhaus used to be part of CAA, but at some point he decided to leave for a rival agency that was run by an old friend of his. He made it clear to Ovitz that he had no ill will toward him or CAA. This was purely about loyalty and friendship, nothing more. According to Esterhaus, Ovitz did not take it well and threatened to ruin his career in Hollywood. Esterhaus would then write a letter to Ovitz defending himself, copies of which circulated around Hollywood and ended up being published in several outlets. And the letter does not paint a flattering picture of Mr. Ovitz, which did not come as a surprise to many people in the industry. You told me that if I left, my foot soldiers who go up and down Wilshire Boulevard each day will blow your brains out. You said that you would sue me. 
I don't care if I win or lose, you said, but I'm going to tie you up with depositions and court dates so that you won't be able to spend any time at your typewriter. You said, if you make me eat shit, I'm going to make you eat shit. As I thought about what happened, I continued increasingly to be horrified by it. You are agents. Your role is to help and encourage my career and my creativity. Your role is not to place me in personal emotional turmoil. Your role is not to threaten to destroy my family's livelihood if I don't do your bidding. I am not an asset. I am a human being. I am not a painting hung on a wall. I am not part of a chess set. This isn't a game. It's my life. I have abhorred bullying of all kinds, by government, by police, by political extremism of the left and the right, by the rich. Maybe it's because I came to this country as a child and was the victim of a lot of bullying when I was an adolescent. But I always fought back. I was bloodied a lot, but I fought back. I think the biggest reason I can't stay with you has to do with my children. I have taught them to fight for what's right. What you did is wrong. I can't teach my children one thing and then, on the most elemental level, do another. I am not that kind of man. So do whatever you want to do, Mike, and f*** you. I have my family, and I have my old manual imperfect typewriter, and they have always been the things I've treasured most. Joe, speaking as a former scrawny, zit-faced nerd who was bullied himself as an adolescent, I totally get where you're coming from, and I applaud you for standing up for yourself. I, for one, think you are setting a fine example for your children. I salute you. But the song still sucks, man. I don't know what to tell you. I mean, you had a chance to really stick it to the man, and this was the best you could come up with? I wanna be Michael Lovitz! I mean, why did you even bother, man? This is sad. Anyway, as I researched this feud between Ovitz and Esterhaas, I encountered multiple articles that suggested this letter was the start of Ovitz's downfall in Hollywood. While it's true he is no longer with CAA, and another agency he founded fell through after just three years, which Ovitz blamed on the gay mafia, classy. The main reason he resigned from CAA in the first place was to take a job as the president of the Walt Disney Company. He only had that job for about a year before Chairman Michael Eisner gave him the boot. Per his contract, he got a severance package and stock options totaling about $140 million for one year's work. This is considered a downfall in Hollywood? Well, shit, sign me up for a downfall. I'll take 12. Hey, Disney, I will gladly do a shitty job as president of your company for one year, and you can pay me half of what you paid Ovitz. Use the other half to pay your furloughed workers, you cheap bastards. Anyway, this whole Michael Ovitz nonsense brings me to another problem with this movie. Who was it made for? There's a lot of stuff in here about Ovitz, and supposedly some of the characters are based on real-life people in Hollywood, but unless you're thoroughly entrenched in the industry, you're not going to get the jokes. Why would you limit your audience like that? That's just setting yourself up for failure. Well, let's get to the plot, shall we? As previously stated, Mr. Smithy was hired to direct Trio, which cost the studio $200 million. That price tag wouldn't be all that shocking today. $200 million is like two-thirds of a Justice League. Or probably one-third by the time they're finished with the Snyder Cut. But in 1998, that was buku money. Titanic was made for $200 million in 1997, and at the time was the most expensive movie ever made. So that's what Trio is supposed to be on par with. And to hear Mr. Smithy tell it, Trio ended up being the drizzling shits. It's worse than Showgirls. It's worse than Showgirls? Get it? Because the guy who wrote this movie also wrote Showgirls? Waka waka. But one of the studio executives, played by Richard Jenny, insists the critics loved it, despite it being an incredibly violent- <laughs> Hey, wait, wait a minute. The entire point of the movie is Smithy stole the negative for Trio before any prints could be made. So what the hell did the critics see? We're only a few minutes into the movie and already I am terribly confused, and after 10 plus years of doing this show, you'd think I'd be used to that by now. Well anyway, I mentioned earlier that the movie is kind of a mockumentary. A large portion of it is presented as interviews with various people directly or indirectly involved with Trio. This includes a few celebrity cameos from actor Billy Bob Thornton, writer Shane Black, TV host Larry King, and movie producer Robert Evans, who somehow looks more unnaturally tan than Donald Trump. And he has this thing about his girlfriends calling him Daddy, which is played for laughs, but is really just creepy. Lucky Daddy. Good thing that incest turns him on. Oh, God! Moving on before we are all sick, 
The problem here, and the reason I say it's kind of a mockumentary, is twofold. First, about half of the interview segments looked like the crew just randomly barged in on these people with a camera and started asking questions. People are interviewed in the middle of work or a meal or while they're at the gym, and there's an astonishing number of segments where people are interviewed just as they're about to get in their cars and leave. It happens to this guy twice. And of course, there's one segment with a producer, played by Ryan O'Neill, getting, ahem, <coughs> serviced in the middle of the interview. Well, at least you didn't have to call him daddy. All of this makes me wonder, have the people who made this movie ever seen a documentary? I know it's not a real documentary, but even mockumentaries like This Is Spinal Tap are still filmed in the style of an actual documentary. If you don't film it that way, it doesn't work. And the second reason it's only kind of a mockumentary is there are several non-interview segments reenacting the events that led to Smithy's theft and destruction of the trio negative that the documentary cameras could not possibly have been present for. Is this supposed to be a mockumentary or a narrative? Either option is fine, but you gotta pick one. Anyway, the first act of Burn Hollywood Burn covers the making of Trio, though they do so in as vague a manner as possible. This is another thing about the movie that bothers me. We're told Trio is so terrible that it compelled Smithy to steal the negative so no one would ever see it. But God forbid the movie presents us with any evidence to back up that claim. All we get to see is a trailer the studio cut before the negative was stolen, and it's pretty basic. Honestly, it looks like the trailer for any Michael Bay movie. And yeah, those usually aren't great, but they're not exactly the worst movies ever. So why should I infer from this that Trio is worse than Showgirls? This ain't enough, guys. I need more. Apart from the trailer, the only bad sign we get is when the producer confirms they had about a dozen writers working on the script, one of which was a movie critic turned screenwriter. Unlike a lot of people in this movie, the critic is not a celebrity cameo, but is instead played by an actress. Why? Well... I'm a film critic. I know it doesn't take much to be a screenwriter. Yeah, good luck finding a real critic who would be willing to say something that's stupid, even as a joke. And a good chunk of the first act basically boils down to this. The producer said this, I never said that. And then he did this, I never did that. And then Sly did this, yo, I never did that. And so on and so forth, and it's just so lazy and repetitive. We also get glimpses of Smithy in the present day, where he apparently had a nervous breakdown and was committed to the Keith Moon Psychiatric Institute, classy, and I'm pretty sure Idol didn't have a script here. I think they just pointed the camera at him and told him to go nuts. Itsy bitsy spider went up the water spout. There are multiple moments in this movie where we see Smithy singing Itsy Bitsy Spider. I don't have a joke for that, I just thought it was worth mentioning. Throughout the film, people are introduced with a selection of bullet points. Fun facts, if you will, except without the fun parts. And one thing I noticed is almost every woman in the movie has feminist as one of their bullet points. Feminist, 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 every woman is a feminist. And one man, because that's what it says to do in the Complete Idiot's Guide to Running Gags. And pardon me if this is a stupid question, but what is the actual gag here? Like, all of these women identify as feminists. Okay. And? Unless you're an incel, just calling someone a feminist in and of itself is not a joke. Context. We need context. Is there any context in the house? Is this another one of those inside Hollywood jokes that I would only get if I was part of the movie industry in the 90s? Follow-up question. If that were the case, would it have aged well? Moving on, the second act really has no reason to exist. It starts off with Smithy stealing the negative, and we already know he's ultimately going to destroy it, so all we're doing is waiting around for that to happen. Suspense? What's that? And that might be okay if only the stuff that happened between Smithy stealing the negative and destroying it were in any way interesting or funny. If only. Smithy ends up befriending and hiding out with a group of black filmmakers led by Leon and Dion Brothers, collectively known as the Brothers Brothers. Because they're brothers. And their last name is Brothers. They're the Brothers Brothers. These are the jokes, people. I just... Uh, yeah. Leon and Dion are played respectively by Chuck D and Coolio. I'm not sure why, but Chuck D's presence would explain how we got Public Enemy songs on the soundtrack. And yet, no Coolio songs. I guess they can only afford one of the two. 
If you're wondering if Chuck D and Coolio can act, the answer is no, not really. I mean, don't get me wrong, I have seen worse, but I've seen a lot better too. Meanwhile, the producer goes on TV to make an impassioned plea for Smithy to come out of hiding and return the negative. And my god, what is up with these TV news sets? They look only slightly more expensive than the one from Birdemic. But I guess I shouldn't be surprised considering the people who made this movie are clearly not fans of the media. Nor are they fans of clever puns. The New York slimes come on. In addition to pleading with Smithy over the airwaves, the studio hires a private investigator played by- Oh, God damn it. Yep, that's Harvey Weinstein. And at the time of this movie's release, I'll bet most people had no idea who he was. Now, we all know for the wrong reasons. And if you're wondering if Harvey Weinstein can act, well, he hasn't been able to convince anyone he actually needs that walker, so I guess that answers that question. Seriously, though, while I will admit I may be looking at his performance through shit-colored glasses, I find him to be boring and robotic. And that makes me very confused because, at the time, a few critics actually praised Weinstein's performance. And all I can say is... Really? We staked out the airport, focusing on flights to Tanzania and Tibet. We staked out the La Brea tar pits. I mean... Really? Also, one of Harvey's bullet points reads, Friend to the Stars. Ooh boy, that did not age well. Granted, I probably can't blame the movie for that. I mean, no one could have known at the time what Harvey was up to. Hello? Yeah? Uh-huh. They knew? They always knew Harvey was a shitbag? They just protected him because Hollywood is a haven for creeps and perverts and they always take care of their own? Well, thanks for clearing that up. I have no idea who that was. Anyway, the Brothers Brothers negotiate on Smithy's behalf and eventually convince the studio to give him final cut and score a three-picture deal for themselves. But the producers almost immediately go back on their word and, with the help of the man who is rightfully rotting in prison, track down Smithy and try to reclaim the negative. Smithy, however, escapes and sets the film on fire. Then we get to the third act where we are introduced to Smithy's lawyer, Robert freaking Shapiro. Yes, that's actually him. For those of you who are too young to remember the O.J. Simpson trial, Google it. And this time I'm serious. I'm not going to get into that because I don't want this video to be three hours long. The algorithm won't help me there. But I will say I am baffled by this. Did anyone still give a shit about Shapiro in 1998? Hell, I'm pretty sure nobody gave a shit about him by the time the verdict was read during the O.J. Simpson trial three years prior. At that point, he had been overshadowed by Johnny Cochran. I really don't get this. That basically sums up the entire movie. I really don't get this. Anyway, the studio decides if they can't release Trio, they'll just make a movie about the making and destruction of Trio. And that's how this travesty was born. The end. And that's an Alan Smithy film, Burn Hollywood Burn. And it is actually worse than Showgirls. At least Showgirls was funny. Not intentionally, mind you, but it still counts. I get the impression the filmmakers could not figure out what kind of movie they wanted to make. The result is a spectacular train wreck. The acting is hit and miss, even from people who are playing themselves, which is ridiculous. I like celebrity self-deprecation as much as the next guy, but none of these celebrity cameo performances feel genuine. They're just weird. But despite his Razzie nomination for Worst Actor, Ryan O'Neal was actually decent. I don't care what anybody says. The editing is just plain lazy, the soundtrack is possibly the worst ever conceived, and was ironically marketed as featuring the best unknown bands in the world. I'd hate to hear the worst. And it commits the number one mortal sin for a comedy. It's not funny. I mean, it does have one or two moments. This bit got a chuckle out of me. No, no, no. That is completely... And there's this outtake that plays over the credits featuring Esther Haas and director Arthur Hiller. The last thing any director needs is you, of all people, to stick up for us. <laughs> He's right, you know. But most of this movie's attempts at comedy are just dreadful. I can count on one hand the number of times I laughed during this movie. 
Maybe I could get up to two hands if I understood all of the inside jokes, but I doubt it. An Alan Smithy film got a very limited release to just 19 theaters, I assume because the producers realized this movie was so bad that there was no reason to subject it to any more people than necessary. Despite its meager $10 million budget, due to its limited release, it made just under $60,000 at the box office. The friggin' Oogie Loves made more money. In addition to Worst Picture, the movie also won Worst Screenplay, Worst Supporting Actor, Worst New Star, and Worst Original Song, all of which are at least partially credited to Mr. Joe Esterhaas. And this is one of those rare occasions where I cannot argue with the Razzie's choice for Worst Original Song. I Wanna Be Mike Ovitz was absolutely terrible. Joe also won a Stinker's Bad Movie Award for Worst On-Screen Hairstyle, which seems kinda mean-spirited, but also correct. And Joe, I meant what I said earlier. Mike Ovitz sounds like a total scumbag, and I applaud you for standing up for yourself. But you probably should have left it with that letter. Every once in a while, the Golden Raspberry Foundation gets one right, and I cannot argue with their choice for Worst Picture of 1998. An Alan Smithy film is easily worse than the other nominees, which included a crappy Michael Bay movie, a crappy Roland Emmerich movie, a crappy big-screen remake of an old TV show, and... Whatever the hell that was. And, fun fact, it's actually responsible for the DGA retiring the Alan Smithy pseudonym. They were legitimately afraid no one would ever again see a movie with the name Alan Smithy attached to it because this movie had tarnished that name's reputation. So an Alan Smithy film was in fact the last Alan Smithy film. I do not recommend giving this movie a watch, not even ironically. It is painful to sit through, and I had to sit through it several times to write this review. More than I usually do because as I was writing it, I had trouble remembering what happened. I don't know if it was just that unmemorable, or if my brain kept blocking out parts of it as a defense mechanism. So if you're wondering why this one took so long to come out, there you go. Sorry about that. Hopefully next time, when we journey into the wild, wild west, my brain will actually cooperate. If you don't, I'll stab you with a Q-tip. Until then, I am the Smeghead, and maybe Hollywood should burn.